Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? All right. I'm down a few quarts, Bruce. Yeah. I, I, uh, I have a cold. I think Miko Koskin and I maybe have the same cold. He doesn't have COVID, and neither does I, according to my the tests I've been taking. Mm-hmm. Um, that is good. I think I had it way back when in February 20, 20, 2020, 2020, eh? 2020, way back when Before people will probably remember me off on this podcast like crazy for a couple months. Anyway, yeah, I'm not feeling great, but um, that was a nice win for the order. Six to one victory of the Anaheim Ducks, a very dominating performance. They got off to a three nothing lead. And this time, Bruce, they never looked back. They didn't have that horrid defensive letdown, which has plagued them in recent games. So it was a pretty good win. What did you think? Yeah, nice to win one on the road. They they struggled. The last time they went on the road was a 3 nothing shutout in Philadelphia. And I'm not even sure it was in March or February. It's a long time <laughs> ago. I guess it was the uh, very beginning of March. And uh, they, then they lost in Chicago. And they've just had a steady string of, uh, as they've been winning, nine in a row at home. Uh, I probably mentioned this last podcast that they also had sort of five losses with only two points on the road. So to come away with two points in one game and in convincing fashion against an old nemesis, so much the better. 6-1 over Anaheim. What's not to like? Let's do our two good things, two bad things, and two numbers. Bruce, what is your good amundo? All right, I'm going to go with the Edmonton's uh, defense pairing of Brett Kulak with Tyson Berry, who I thought both of them had excellent games. Uh, Berry had one or two adventures at the back end like he usually does, uh, but they weren't harmful. And both guys wound up the night with a goal and two assists for three points, uh, with Kulak posting an impressive plus five. Barry, an almost as impressive plus four. His stat sheet reads one, two, three, plus four. And that's a nice way to start your uh, your game log any old time. And I I like the um, the way those guys move the puck between themselves. Like, I think they trust each other that, you know, whichever one's in the better position, get that guy the puck <clears throat> and let him move with it and get going. And they're, you know, they're, they're not a big, tough, difficult defense pair to break through but what you want them to do and what they really did tonight was play to their strengths and that is skating and moving the puck and making smart plays in the offensive zone and it seemed like like they weren't even in on the same goals only the yeah, third goal that's right, Nugent, Bruce. Nugent Hopkins from Barry and Kulak otherwise it was uh, Barry was in on the first three goals and Kulak was in on the third fifth and sixth goals. He scored the fifth goal. Uh, he was Leon Dreisaitl's best friend, and he scored the fifth goal on a point shot uh, that dribbled through John Gibson uh, to make the score 5-1 and to erase any sort of a uh, uh, little bit of doubt that might have been raised when Anaheim cut the margin to 4-1 and had a couple more chances after that. And that, that goal put it away. And then about four minutes later, it was Kulak who made the beautiful cross-seam pass uh, from left point to the lower right circle for Leon to unleash the executioner's shot that uh, uh, provided the sixth and would-be meaningless goal uh, of the game other than it was Leon's 50th of the season, 50 goals, 5-0 goals and on, on a wicked drive and on a night that he had to fight through some things that we'll talk about in a bit but uh, uh, Kulak uh, lots to like in that game goal was a bit lucky but now he's on the board as a as an Edmonton Oiler and uh, they uh, mm-hmm. they seem to be pretty happy when they when they fish the puck out for him and you know it looks like he's fitting in pretty nicely on the team there as I can tell from you know the play but also just seems the general chemistry is good yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see if he works out better than Kulikov did um, last mm-hmm. year. Because by the end, Kulikov wasn't starting in the last playoff game that he could have played in. He had lost the confidence of the coaching staff. And I don't recall being um, 
so much against that decision at the time. Like he, he had not played great in the playoffs. I thought he was okay in the regular season. It's my recollection of uh, yep. Kulikov. They're very they're hard. different players and they paid a much higher price for Kulak, you know, yeah. in terms of like the value of the draft pick, it's about three or four times the value of the draft pick pick that they paid for Kulikov, a second rounder as compared to a fourth. So Kulak, um, more is riding on him. He's a very interesting player, Bruce. He he reminds me of a smaller version of smaller, lesser. He's like Jay Bo Meester Light. He's this. He's big, fairly big, and man, can he skate? He is a he is a beautiful skater out there. Very very fast and smooth, like Bo Meester was. And so far, at least, he's been okay. I'd say this was his easily his best game. Um, I gave him an eight, grade of eight out of ten. Yeah. But I think he might be on to something. We'll see. You know, this was against a weaker semi-AHL team playing out the string. Um, so we'll see how Barry and Kulak do against LA, against Vegas, against, you know, tougher games coming up, whoever they're against. Um, you know, some bigger, tougher teams, the Flames. We'll see how that goes. But a lot can a lot can go right for defensemen who keep it simple, like if they can keep it simple on defense, not try to overextend yourself on the attack too much, keep it simple and use your speed and puck moving. That can go a long way in the NHL. And uh, so I'm, of course, hopeful. And that was a very, that was an absolutely exceptional diagonal dart over to Dreisaitl for, as you say, the executioner shot. And so how fitting that he gets the big goal on the on that that kind of shot. So nice, ni- nice for Leon Dreisaitl there. Yeah, yeah, like you could see because of the the TV angle that uh, um, Kulak was on the near side, and you could see that lane. It was about five feet wide between the left defenseman and the left winger for Anaheim, and Leon was in it. And it's like, geez, I hope he sees that lane. I hope he can get the puck through. I hope Leon can get, get good contact. I hope <clears> it, 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 all those things happen. Like right away, it was in the net, just bam, and uh, sweet moment. So, uh, and as for Tyson Berry. You know, the goal that he scored that opened the scoring where he had the puck at the blue line and he uh, he didn't like the one-timer because there was a guy in the shooting lane and he pulled it back and he kind of walked, not really the blue line because he was in a few feet, but he did the backwards walk until the lane opened up and the traffic built up in front of the net and he sifted one through that was, you know, a wrist shot. Accurate wrist shot through traffic is better than a slap shot into somebody's shin pads a hundred times out of a hundred, and he uh, he uh, pulled it off nicely there. So yeah, ask Andre Secker about that. <laughs> um, my uh, this leads into my good thing, Bruce. Mm-hmm. For years, the Oilers have gone to California and they have lost, and they have lost on a certain kind of goal, which I call the Californian. Uh, and the Californian consists of this. The other teams grinding it out on the cycle. They put it back to the point for, you know, a nothing shot. They put the nothing shot on net, but there's two guys screening, one or two guys screening, and the puck goes in. And uh, the the Oilers never scored that kind of goal, or hardly ever scored that kind of goal. Mm -hmm. Bruce rarely scored it compared to how often, relatively less than the opposition. It must have been two or three to one. Seems like it for sure, for years. For years. Tips and screens, yeah. Oh, it was so hard to take. (laughs) <laughs> in, the, in the in the playoffs against Anaheim, it wasn't there like in that comeback game, wasn't there like two or three in a row of these kind of Cal- the Californian was pulled executed two or three times in a row in that big playoff game by the Ducks. Anyway, nice to see, and this is a trend for the Oilers. They are scoring this kind of goal more often. Um, maybe we're gonna have to go back and try to quantify it if we can't um, compared to other years because we are tracking goalie screens on goals. So the first one is, of course, Barry's shot. But that puck does not go in without a... With, and this wasn't mentioned as much on the broadcast because they were fixated it on whether Kane had touched it or not. Right. But yes, Harvey was right in front of the goalie. And he had to, you know, as Barry's going across, he doesn't know where Barry is. Gibson right. doesn't know where Barry is because it's... it's right. he doesn't know where yes, And then Kane also was putting a screen there. So the old high-low screen that Detroit was so good at in their heyday um, on the power play, especially, they pulled that off. The next one is an even better screen. This is by Zach Cassian. It's a total eclipse of the sun, Bruce. Gibson is like in the dark, shivering in the cold, 
<laughs> such as the shadow of Zach Cassian on this play. And Warren Fogel also screens him. Yes. So when Nuge puts a, a, a fairly good, you know, a good outside wrister, like a B grade scoring chat shot on net goes in because of that great screen. You could also include, you know, McDavid's goal um, on the power play went right through um, the legs Doc, Doc of uh, the Shattenkirk, I believe it was. Okay, then we finally go to the third period and Kulak's goal um, uh, is scored with Hyman. Another great screen. That doesn't go on without Zach Hyman in front of the net. So three Californians they executed. Mm-hmm. And maybe we see many more because that is a <laughs> that is a most welcome. That's a playoff goal. That's the kind of goal that the Oilers are going to need in the playoffs every second game at least, or maybe even once a game. If they're going to win in the playoffs, they're going to have to probably get one a game. So um, that's probably maybe a bit too much. But well, one, in the, one a game in the games they win. Games yeah, that they right. get one, their chances are a lot better, obviously. So. Yeah, that's right. So <laughs> good to see them looking for this goal, executing this goal. Um, not surprising that they're starting to get them. They have lots of defensemen. They finally have the defensemen, actually. Bouchard had seven shots on net. They finally have the defensemen who can put the puck on net consistently. And, they've, you know, Bouchard, Barry, uh, Darnell Nurse can get the puck on net somewhat. Um, we'll see if Kulak can do it, how much he can do it. So, um, Duncan Keith can do it. So it's not a bad, Cody CC can do it now and then. So this is the best shooting group of defensemen for just getting pucks on net in, since 2006, right? Since, since then, since Pronger was on the team and Bergeron and Spot uh, The 09, 08, 09 team was, yeah, was Gilbert, uh, right, pretty loaded Chicago. with uh, top four, at least of, uh, D, I'm not sure the third pairing, uh, Smead and Steos, were necessarily offensive drivers, but uh, they top were not. Four we're all over 30 points, which is very <clears throat> mm-hmm. uh, that year. But yeah, it's been, uh, I think there's more uh, 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 puck moving skill. I mean, you could probably find a team that had a clap bomb and nurse on it that uh, that uh, might be closer than Ant Secro, you know, that maybe. But uh, right now, there are guys. Uh, <laughs> moving the puck and like you said the two of those goals came through double screens where you had a second guy in, in the first lined up I mean on Nuge's goal not only was Cassian in there but uh, Fogel went right through the line of sight of the goalie just as Nuge was lining up to to let fly and uh, there was three ducks that were trying to trying to fend them off so once Nuge's shot didn't hit any of those five guys in front of the net. <laughs> Poor John Gibson didn't have a whole lot of chance to see it. So, you know, I mean, a lot of those shots you're going to lose because it's going to hit the traffic. But uh, Nuge picked the corner pretty nice there. What's your bad thing, Bruce? Yeah, this is a tough game for bad things. So I'm going to leave the more obvious one to you. But uh, <laughs> uh, Anaheim only scored one goal, so I guess I will... Uh, I will single in on that. And there was, it was just a little lapse of maybe 30 or 40 seconds where Edmonton was just not moving the puck out of their own zone. They had a couple of chances to get it out and they, uh, uh, you know, they sort of reset and reloaded and twice they got it outside the blue line, but they never made it even as far as center uh, before losing a battle. And, and uh, uh, Zach Hyman lost the, uh, uh, lost the last battle just outside of uh, Edmonton's blue line, and Anaheim came back on the uh, uh, on the counter attack, and the shot was uh, wasn't that dangerous. <clears throat> Keith, Keith was kind of in position to stop the shot. He didn't screen Smith, but Smith punted out kind of a kind of an ugly rebound, and then he kind of overplayed the rebound. I think he was expecting the guy to pick the corner, and he. Did the splits and of course the puck went right through him and into the net. But uh, you know, one goal against on uh, uh, 32 shots. Yeah, so it's it's not going to too much criticize Mike Smith, even as his uh, form was at times a little bit old school. I said I said to my wife uh, that one time he was down on the ice and he was trying to pick himself up and he kind of flopped this way and he flopped that way and then he saw the puck come and he just kind of reached out and grabbed it as it was going by and he was still laying on the ice. And I said to my wife, I get up off the floor quicker than uh, 
and Smith got up on that play. And believe me, me getting up off the floor is not a pretty sight at my age and, and general <laughs> fitness level. <laughs> We've seen that play from Smith a couple of times, Bruce, and it's a, like, honestly, it's a little concerning. The one where he flopped. So it's kind of a wraparound play behind the net. Instead of like yeah, pushing off and stopping it with his pad, pad, he's turning and he's he's going diving. He's leap, diving on his belly glove first. That is not a high percentage play. And, and it, then it put him in this terrible position where suddenly a point shot becomes this heroic save. I mean, that was it was a basic save and it was only looked so incredible because Mike Smith had look so bad on that particular play like and it, it's it's just part of his movement right now which seems disjointed and uh is is a cause for concern but as you say bruce um he he had a good game i gave him a seven out of ten that's fair. he um there was nine did we say the grade a shots 18 no, to nine for the ask, orders yeah 18, nine, 18 yeah. to nine for the orders six to five but when it came to the five alarm shots it was six to five um most of the anaheim Three of the Anaheim five shots came when the game was over, essentially, when it was four nothing. Uh, of the five alarm shots, three out of um, their five. Well, yeah, David, I'm thinking that you know, they've 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 renamed styles of goaltending after wildlife, right? I mean, there's the butterfly style that everybody talks about. I'm thinking Smith's style, especially on a wraparound, is more like a dolphin, you know, in the sea world, the ones who come out and jump through the rings and leave the surface of the water all together as they're. As they're getting their peanuts or whatever it is, <laughs> and uh, there was a maybe couple a, of rap- maybe. they're targeting him on the wraparound. You could see it. Anaheim tried yeah, two or yeah. three times to just beat him around the net to the far side, and they couldn't execute mm-hmm. it. But uh, they had him on the on the full scramble a couple of times. So it is it is worrisome. And that said, he made some fine saves. He he really made a, a <coughs> excellent pair of saves who was the guy who got in close and he jammed a shot and then the rebound he tried to slide it under and smith was able to pin it to the ice with his pad that was a real tough stop and he was able to keep that up and that was right after they made it 4-1 if they score there and it's 4-2 then oh well or there's fans at least maybe the team and, would have been uh, calm. adam <laughs> henry that was adam yes. henry yes it was yeah you're right yeah. Bruce, I think he needs a better better branding on on than the dolphin on that kind of save he's right. making. I think he should call it, he should call it the jungle cat. You okay. know, he's leaping forward with his claws Pounce. to get the puck. The po- okay. He's pouncing. That's what it is. I would call it the stumble. That's what it looks like to me, unfortunately. So he doesn't want to ha- hire me as his branding agent. All right. Uh, the, uh, I've fallen and I can't get up. Yeah. <laughs> My bad thing was Leon's injury. Um, it it looked not good, especially through the second period. Of course, as the game went on, he seemed to loosen up and play, move more freely. By the end, he was able to obviously execute that the you know his trademark shot to get the to get the big goal. So um, <laughs> that greatly cheered him up. And at the end of the game, in an interview, he told uh, Gene Principe, "I'm all good. Don't worry about me." So, um, but when that happened, it's just it was scary. It was scary to a certain extent, although Leon is the kind of guy, Bruce, I, I, you know, um, you might, you know, people of a certain age will remember Pete Rose, you know, they're kind of built like fire hydrants and, and Leon isn't quite as stubby as Pete Rose was, but he, he is this incredibly solid individual. Like he's like, uh, Peter, the Oak tree, Peter Nogley. Um, he's not going to get injured easily. I think he's got a very durable kind of of um build for hockey i'm not trying to jinx him here by saying this but i think that's that's a fair comment on on you know if that had been connor going into the boards knee first like that and smacking it i would have been that would have been some some people just have different builds and leon is this big bone guy who can withstand a lot of punishment so he's played in the in his nhl well it's kind of hard to yeah, 82 full season, 78, so he missed four games there. 82 full season, 71 full season. Yeah. 56, was that a full, full season? season? Yeah. Full season, and now he's played every game this year. So he's not a guy who misses games, yeah. and it's. I think a lot of it has to do with his incredible uh, physique. I mean, he's just a, yeah. he's a tank. Oh, so. he's a tank. Uh, no, he got hurt early in uh, uh, 2017, 18 season. This was just after he'd signed his contract. And Jacob Truba mm-hmm. of Winnipeg Jets shoulder capped him in the chin. 
and he missed four games with a concussion. There was a popular urban myth that he and Darnell Nurse had had a falling out. Oh, um, but uh, I watched the replay of uh, Jason Truba shoulder capping him in the chin enough times to say, well, it's a mighty strange coincidence that of all, this would be of all times the game Drysaddle got drilled in the in the button to be getting into a fight with a teammate. I kind of doubt that story, but uh, it had legs for a while. But uh, Jacob, Jacob Truba shoulder capped him in the chin and he missed four games with a concussion. And he has that was early in the season. And he's basically played five seasons since without missing a game other than you know, a whole <coughs> week missing games because the seasons have been shorter. Here's his shooting percentage, Bruce, in the last four years now that I'm on his, on his stats page. 21.6, 19.7, 18.5, and 20.4. I guess it has been sustainable. Because, uh, you know, that all, that always comes up when, it's, when, when in his first big year. It's not unsustainable. And then you, you remind people, at, well, actually, there are these. There's not a lot of them. But there's these players who are picky about shooting and they have great shots. And there's in the NHL at any one time, there's what, 10 to 20 of them, I'm guessing. Maybe not that many even, but at least there's at least 10 of these guys who have high shooting percentages. They're often kind of the Thomas Holmstrom kind of player, Hornquist. Probably watch someone will check their shooting percentage and they'll have like a 9.3 career average. But they're often guys who play right in the front of the net. But um, Leon's one of them. He doesn't play right in front of the net, but he just has such an incredible shot and incredible shot selection that he will oh, – that he will – he's having a run of – historically high shot percentages for his time in the NHL and he's keeping it up. I mean, on the executioner shots on his one timers, we've tracked this over the years and he hits on about a third of them. When they're on net, this is this thing on where net. shooting percentage only counts shots that are on net. So if you fire yeah. wide, it doesn't count against your shooting percentage. But So on those grade A shots on net, the one timers, he, he, he scores on about a third of them. So, all right. So, uh, your number. Yari Curry. Oh. This isn't a, a my number, but this is a number. The great Yari Curry from 1983 to 1987, four years in a row north of 25%. Wow. Can you imagine 26.7, 26.6, 28.6, 25 25.6%. And he scored 52, 71, 68, and 54 goals. And the one year before and the two years after, he was over 20%. And he scored 43, 44, and 45 goals in those years. So I think Yari was a pretty uh, sustainable high percentage shooter that, uh, of course, he was set up for an awful lot of very good looks by a, a, a fine centerman that he played with a lot. Who do you think has a better one-timer, Bruce? Dreisaitl or Curry? Oh, boy, that's a good question. Uh, my, my, I'm, I'm going on memory and I'm going to say Curry. I mean, he just, there was, his was quicker. It was more compact. He got it off faster, and um, it was just more of a bang bang play. Leon needs a little bit more time and space. His usually come on the power play, where I think Yari was able to get off more of those kind of shots at even strength. So that's my memory, and and uh, may be incorrect. Well, and shorthanded. I mean, how many times do we see Curry and Gretzky on a, oh, a yeah. penalty kill? Yeah. And it was all about the counterattack for those guys. And they, they got a lot of good chances on the penalty kill because they were playing against an offensive-minded group for change. So my number, uh, my number is 50 and, and 50. That's 50 goals and 50 assists. Uh, now, if Jenny Malkin did this back in the 2011-12 season, 50 goals, 59 assists for Pittsburgh, and he won the Hart Trophy that year with something like 99% of the vote. So 10 years now since then, including this season, which of course isn't complete. Uh, this feat has been accomplished two times in 10 years, 50 goals and 50 assists in the same season. And the two, oh, oh wait a minute, the one person who accomplished it, Leon Dreisaitl, 2018-19, 50 goals, 55 assists. <laughs> Leon Dreisaitl, 2021-22, 50 goals, 51 assists with 12 games left on the calendar this time. So obviously he's going to exceed those numbers by... Uh, by uh, some margin, and maybe some other player will creep into that category, although I don't know who it is, because most of the big goal scorers like Austin Matthews, their assist totals are a little low, and it's tough to do both. It's tough to be a great goal scorer and a great playmaker, and Leon Dreisaitl is both. 
and he's done this feat twice in the last 10 years, and nobody else has done it even once. Yeah, Matthews is interesting. You know, he is Toronto's world's greatest Toronto player in Toronto. So, um, and he's <laughs> he has 88 points this year, Bruce. Dreisaitl mm-hmm. has 101. McDavid has 105. We'll see how the MVP voting shakes out. A lot of people think Shesterkin, the goalie from New York, is going to win it. But I wouldn't, if Connor McDavid can uh, go on a little run here, and, and out, if he and Dreisaitl really outpace the their opponents and the, and the Oilers make a good run to end the season. I could see McDavid winning the MVP again. Um, probably right. ahead of Leon, although it's a, it's a tough argument about who's been better. Like, honestly, I, I might vote for Leon myself over Connor McDavid. In 1819, when Leon got 50 goals and 55 assists, he never got a single, even fifth place vote <sighs> for the Hart Trophy. It was ridiculous. Oh, I was like, geez. well, it's McDavid from Oilers, and they didn't make the playoffs, so there's no way we're voting for two Oilers. And obviously, Leon was, uh, you know, living off of Connor's passes, and it's Connor doing all the heavy lifting. And three years, three great seasons later from both players, it's looking a lot more like a true partnership. Well, Bruce, him. in that 2018-19 season, all the smart guys knew that his shooting percentage was unsustainable. Unsustainable. Yeah, unsustainable. So, uh, and that he was overpaid, grossly overpaid, right? That was the other thing. So, you know, that, that, that didn't zero last long, out of two but, ain't bad. Yeah. yeah. All right. Anyway, uh, uh, that's my number is 50, not 50 in 50, but 50 and 50, 50 goals yeah. and 50 assists. Okay. You know, I'm making fun of the unsustainable thing, but that was a really key, that was a really key concept introduced by numbers guys. Um, to a lot of fans who weren't that aware, you know, it came out of baseball, this awareness that players can have unsustainable numbers. Yep. Um, and, yes. you know, in terms of batting average and home runs and such. And and they go on hot streaks and you can't count on that to continue. And it was a really good point. And, and more often than not, when people bring it up, it's, it's a fair comment because it's true. Someone's on a really hot run. They're not going to sustain it. And it's important to keep that in mind before getting all excited and saying, oh, we award this guy a new contract or pay him big money or he's he's the best player in the league or whatever it is um very often it is unsustainable uh bruce my number is 94 to 6 94 to 6 so after mike smith's rough game last game i did a twitter poll should the orders stick with smith or koskinen that got six percent of the vote or should they call up Stu skinner and send smith to the hl and that got 94 percent of the vote so nice to see Mike Smith stick that right up our all of our butts um, with a good game. And um, but but we'll see. You, you could run that poll again now after the game, and it would probably be ninety to ten. Same probably. Direction. Yeah, yeah, I <laughs> think of, so. A lot of minds are made up on on Smith, and you know, and rightfully so. I mean, we've seen lots of visible evidence, or at least understandably so, I should say that. Uh, that people sort of seen enough and saying, okay, it's time to move on to someone who can get up after he makes a save. <laughs> I, I hope he does just sh- shove it for the rest of the year to on us. Like just, just stick it to us. Fine just me. fine by me, man. Like I'm, I'm rooting for the guy. He was my, he heading into the year. He was my favorite player. Like he was such a team leader, such a great year last year. He has been injured repeatedly this year. And he is not the same mm-hmm. player. And he still doesn't look like the same player to me. And I hope Skinner gets a game. The next, if if Koskinen remains sick, put Skinner in the next game, because you have a better chance of winning with Skinner than Mike Smith. And I have just no qualms at all about saying that. And and I, and I wonder why it ha- hasn't happened already. Like I, I know you got to stick with the veteran, stick with team chemistry and all that stuff, but you got to win. And Stuart Skinner gives you a better chance of winning. Next so. game's at San Jose, which is where Skinner played his last game in the NHL and got a shutout. So that might that might play into uh, uh, Jay Woodcroft's uh, reasoning as to how he goes with the next game. If if Costin's not ready, then you got to think, yeah, do we want to use the forty-year-old three times in a row in a five-day span, or are we better off to to uh, share the wealth? So, are there back-to-backs this week at all? Oh, it's every other day. First, third, fifth, seventh, ninth. And then they so, finally get two days off in a row. Conceivably, if um, Skinner played really well, he could even get the start against L.A. Like, and, and I think that would give them a better chance of winning. 
um, if he looks sharp in the San Jose game. Then Koskinen or then Smith? Then Smith. Koskinen, if he just has a cold, he probably won't be out that long. Or food poisoning or whatever it is. Who knows what it is. Alrighty, Bruce. Well, they're on a bit of a rip here. They're four in a row. Four wins in a row, and it's a good thing, too, because they are not getting a whole lot of help from around the NHL on the out-of-town scoreboard. It's got one game to check, though. I think Seattle was look, was looking good against Dallas, uh, but uh, Vancouver, or Vancouver tied Vegas, but then they couldn't finish the job and lost it in overtime, so Vegas got another win. And... Uh, are we not here? Dallas won, Seattle four. What do you know? Because it seemed like all the teams we were fighting with Seattle, LA King, or not Seattle, sorry, uh, LA King, St. Louis, um, Dallas, the, uh, Vegas, they were all winning like all of their games. And so Edmonton winning four straight is huge. And even though it hasn't moved them up the stand, he's just, just holding serve. While the other teams are going on winning streaks is just hugely important. Evan could have lost a ton of ground this week with a couple of losses. Yeah. And they never happened. They, you know, from Monday to Sunday, 4-0. Oh. It's keeping them, they're only four points back at the Calgary Flames. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, Calgary has a couple of games in hand. But they're in touch. It's kept them in touch with the Flames, who have who have been on a not such a great streak. Four wins, four, four wins and six losses out of their last uh, 10 games, the Flames. Yeah, they lost so, a couple um, of teams. They could have helped the Oilers by winning, and they they couldn't beat the Kings or the or the um, Blues. I I like this Oilers team. The goaltending is iffy, and their defense, as we were talking about last game, can be iffy. Um, they've got a crack a heavy forecheck. They're they're yeah. They're they do, Bruce. Yeah, these are the two weaknesses of this team, and and you know, can they? work through both of those they're going to need to to have playoff success if not just to make the playoffs i i think they're going to make the playoffs i've been kind of hoping predicting playoff success this year we'll see by the end of the year how they look in these last 12 games they have had some defensive issues and goalie issues that are Mm -hmm. you can't i can't ignore no one's ignoring them so see what happens All right, thanks for talking tonight, Bruce. All right, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.